When I was a little kid, my favorite comic strip series of all time was Calvin and Hobbes. And I'll never forget, one of the first Calvin and Hobbes books I ever had, there was this one strip in it that always stood out to me. So it sets itself up where Calvin's mom is walking through the living room and she sees this table or vase or something that's been broken. And she wants to know who did it. Obviously it was Calvin. We all know it was Calvin. We know what he's like. But when it cuts to Calvin, since he's such an imaginative kid, he is in his mind picturing himself as this noir detective or private eye named Tracer Bullet. Who, and the whole art for the um, thing changes where it's become very dark and grainy and edgy, kind of like what you'd expect from a noir style movie or TV show. And he's doing inner monologues to himself, just like you'd see in the noir kind of setup. And it was so, so funny. Obviously, his mom busts in, wants to know what's going on, but in his mind, it's this dame who's come to beg for him to solve something. He shows up, but she's there to punish him because she knows he did it. And it's really, really funny. Go read it for yourself. But the reason it stood out to me was because I love noir fiction. I love noir stories and fiction. Uh, like all that old stuff, like stuff with Humphrey Bogart, like the Maltese Falcon or uh, 1958's Vertigo um, with Alfred Hitchcock or Sunset Boulevard um, or what's another good one? Um, the Night of the Hunter, 1955. Uh, a lot, Leave her to Heaven. Leave her to Heaven's another good one. Um, and of course, obviously you see nods to it and stuff like your friend Roger Rabbit, which is more kid friendly, but still it has elements of that mixed in and you get some of that in the game LA Noir, or you also get, uh, what was that other one? I'm trying to think of one from, uh, I think it was, I think it was, I think it was a Fritz Lang film, The Big Heat. The Big Heat, that's right. It was called The Big Heat. But I love those old style noir movies, those old noir, edgy, dark, dramatic movies. I think those are really, really good movies. And I also like the stories that can go around them. And I'll be honest, seeing noir style cop stories are really cool. See, I don't like a lot of cop shows these days. A lot of cop movies today, I'm just not a big fan of. I don't enjoy them. Like, you can tell there's a difference between Law & Order and Law & Order SVU. With Law & Order, that's pretty good storytelling. You know, Law & Order is, you got a story about a drama or a crime and they're trying to solve it. With SVU, yeah, you might have a crime to solve for a little bit, but it's mostly just going to focus on the main character's own personal demons, which, granted, can go into noir. A lot of noir is dealing with the main characters having personal demons, but it got boring. The, the last really good cop show that I can think of would be Blue Bloods. That would be the last one that I really liked. But they don't make a lot of good noir stories or movies like they used to. Like, like you won't see much of it anymore because it's edgy. It's not always safe to do that kind of stuff anymore in the mainstream media. But I really do love it. And that is kind of the origin story of Troy and Frost, which is the story sharing we're going to be doing today. But I can't take full credit for this story. I want to um, give a shout out to my buddy Jay. Jay is one of my best friends, and he is an artist, a professional comic artist. And he showed me one time this image of a character he made named James Troy, who he said was this uh, private eye. And... He had wanted James Troy to be a private eye during the World War II era, during the 40s and 50s, and he was, you know, hunting down dangerous people and organizations, you know, kind of doing what he had to do to keep people safe. But he worked outside of the police department because he saw the police often as just as corrupted as anything else. And he wanted to know if maybe I could help create a story around that. And I said, let's see what I can do. And I had a character that I had designed but had never um, given a story to named Elizabeth Frost, who was basically this dame, you know, like a nightclub singer in a noir kind of setting. And I thought, you know what, let's, let's bring these two together. Let's have James Troy and Elizabeth Frost be partners who work together to uh, solve crimes and, you know, do their private eye work. And I started making a story in my head, and it really slowly started to come out as this really fun and gripping story about something bigger than I ever thought it would be. So the idea of the story was that um, James Troy and Elizabeth Frost get a case about a dockhand worker who was strangled to death, and the police have ruled it a gang violence thing, but Troy thinks that there may be more to it, so he goes to check it out and finds out that there may be something s sneaky going on on the dock, so he goes back one night to check it out, discovers a Nazi U-boat in the harbor. See, this is taking place just before America's getting involved in the war. The war in uh, Europe is still getting started, so America isn't involved yet, but this U-boat is now a problem, so he wants to find out what the hell's going on with this U-boat, so he does some fierce digging and investigating and finds out a dark secret, that to ensure America does not get involved in the war, the Nazis are planting chemical bombs all over uh, the New York City area, and if they can, across the states in secret places, and are going to threaten the United States, basically, that if you get involved, we'll detonate these. You don't know where they are, and if you try to look into it, we'll detonate them and kill hundreds 
hundreds of thousands of people. And so Troy now has to jump through not only the Nazis, but also the red tape of politics and the police department and uh, figure out how the Nazis are doing this, where they're hiding the bombs and how to stop them. And along the way, he's also realizing that this could be his last case because it's getting very dangerous. He nearly gets killed twice in the story and he's starting to wonder what life is really all about, what all he's missing out on. And he starts to really think about his relationship with Elizabeth Frost and whether or not he thinks it's safe to even confess those feelings to her, even though it's very clear how she feels about him. So it's a lot of intrigue, a lot of drama, a lot of crime, a lot of, a lot of stuff like that. We, I had a ball writing this. And of course, Jay really loved it because you can see all this art he's done for it, all this really cool art. Like we dive into Troy's background with the police and about why he left the police. We also dive into Frost's background, how she, um, how she lost her uh, father, and mother to uh, because they were witnesses to a crime and she always wanted that solved. I, I think my favorite part of the story, my favorite part of the story was when we have a flashback. Troy was shot up and he's in the hospital and while he's in a coma, there's a flashback portion of the story where we see how he met Frost and how Frost had actually hired him to look into her father's death he, he finds out how he died, but he knows that he can't touch this because of all the red tape. So he goes back to her to tell her that. And it turns out she knew all along. She just wanted to see if Troy would actually help her. And she explained, I think my favorite line in it was, uh, she, he basically, she, he says, why did you want me to look into it? Like, why did you want me to look into this when you already know? And he, she says, you don't have much experience with women, do you? And he goes, can't say I do. Why? She says, for a lot of us women, it's not about uh, winning. It's about being right. She says, I knew, and, but I could shoot up every gangbanger in the city and every mob boss in the city and it wouldn't bring me any comfort. But the idea that there are people out there like you, knights in shining armor ready to come to the rescue of some poor girl from the, from the streets, that gives me some comfort. You know, that, that kind of thing. Like She, she kind of gives off this air that for a long time she's just never seen herself as a damsel in need of a prince to save her. Not because she doesn't want a prince to save her, but because she doesn't think that prince exists. Like, why would she hold on to a fairy tale when the fairy tale is never going to come true? And, and like, just st stuff like that. I, I actually really love diving into that. Sometimes the dialogue between the two is just so much fun. And I think that's what's great about Troy and Frost for me. It dives into something that I really love to write, but also the dialogue. With Troy and Frost, I got to play with dialogue, setting, tone. Tone was big in Troy and Frost. I actually think that was one of my stronger moments in the story where I could build up a dark or gritty tone or a lighthearted tone or a frightful tone because that's the key to noir is setting a tone or a feeling around the scene. Like that, I think that that is very, very important. Um, now, if I could talk about where I got things wrong, where things that I messed up. I think that one of the things that I messed up on is I didn't go enough into James Troy's own background as a cop. Like I hinted at it, I dropped hints about it, and if I could go back and continue the story and keep working on it, which I plan to do, I'm not done with the story, I'm only about halfway through with the book, um, I, I would probably go back and dive a little bit more into who he is and why he became a cop and why he left the police later on, like what it was that pushed him to become law enforcement, why he and Frost connect so much. I would also put a little, I would also, I think my biggest problem was this, I started writing Troy and Frost while I was not very good at writing detective or mystery stories. I'm just not good at that. It's not my forte. Um, so the problem was, one of the big issues I had was I had trouble writing the mystery. And so I revealed way too much, way too early. I needed more time to draw out the mystery, drop more clues, lead to more questions, lead to more individuals to talk to or to question. I was in such a rush to get to the fun and the chase and the awesomeness of it all that I didn't leave time for things to settle and for the audience to take in what they were reading. And I think that's one of the biggest weaknesses of Troy and Frost. I'm still reading it in audio format so that you guys can hear the story um, live and I'll be uploading more of those uh, chapters onto the channel uh, over time. But that is pretty much Troy and Frost. You've been seeing the uh, pictures of it going across the screen. You've been hearing me talk about it. I hope you guys found it interesting. It's one of my favorite stories that I've worked on and I want to thank Jay big time for letting me use Troy um, and also for just working with me on it and doing all these cool pictures. It's actually funny. He fell in love with Frost too. He's kind of like, man, I, I didn't know how Troy and Frost would go together, but now I can't picture Troy without Frost with him. And I'm like, that's awesome. That means that I really gave believability to their relationship, which is really, really cool. But anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed that. And as always, I will see you in my next video. Take care.